Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another lecture. Today, we're taking a look at John Rawls. This will complement the lecture on Nozick. So in Nozick, we saw an argument uh, really to the effect that taxation is really a form of theft. People have a right to their property and that there's no correct pattern to the just distribution of property or holdings or wealth in a society. Right? Nozick doesn't think it's, it's a question of how much do certain segments of the population have? That's the right question to ask if we're trying to determine whether or not holdings are just. But rather, the correct questions to ask are those questions in the entitlement theory, uh, namely, have the principles been followed? Was the initial acquisition of property, making unowned things become owned? How did that work? Once things became owned, were transfers of holdings between people done on a voluntary basis? If they weren't done on a voluntary basis, that would be a form of injustice. Has the injustice been rectified? As long as all people are entitled to the holdings they hold, then the distribution of goods in society is just. And this is really a historical um, question for Nozick, not a question of what's the current distribution of those holdings really like? What's, what's the pattern? We're going to see Rawls defend a version of uh, an end state principle theory or, or a theory about distributive justice that does support having some kind of pattern society. And we're going to see that Rawls himself is a little bit open ended on exactly what that pattern is going to look like, but he thinks we can come to broad agreement on at least one key feature of that pattern, and it's that whatever the pattern is, it's going to be to the greatest advantage to the least advantaged members of society. That is, whatever way we decide to distribute holdings or, or wealth or property in our society, what we should be really keeping an eye on is how well the worst off people in our society is doing. So we'll, we'll get around to that end point, but that's just a little glimpse of where we're headed. Now, Rawls himself, uh, another 20th century American philosopher like Nozick, uh, as I mentioned last time, Rawls wrote this book of theory of justice that came out in 1971. It was a very important and influential book, in some ways really uh, reinvigorated political philosophy in the English speaking world. It is really a landmark in social and political philosophy. So virtually all social political theorizing that's come after Rawls has somehow taken Rawls into account. Uh, many people still effectively defend some version of what Rawls was arguing for here. Other people criticize Rawls, other people aim to correct Rawls. Um, if you're going to go on and do political theory or political philosophy, I can almost guarantee you're going to run into Rawls again. Now, I mentioned last time that Nozick's own book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, that came out in 1974, was really written as a response to Rawls. And Nozick and Rawls knew each other. They, they talked to each other. They were, I, I don't know if I've Quite want to say they were friends, but they were certainly friendly. Um, and so part of what's going on here, which I think is always something nice to see, is a, a debate in good faith between two people thinking hard about these sorts of uh, difficult issues. And they come up with competing answers and they're trying to exchange reasons and really provide the best arguments they can in favor of their own positions and raise objections to other sorts of positions as well. So We'll go ahead and take a look at Rawls here uh, and, and just sort of keep Nozick in the back of your head. I might uh, talk about Nozick from, from time to time here, but there's enough to say when it comes to just getting through Rawls' theory itself. His writing is fairly dense. I think Nozick is a little bit more playful, a little bit easier to read. That said, there's an awful lot going on in Rawls. And if you pick up a theory of justice, it's, I mean, it's something like 600 pages long. Uh, it's a little bit of a slog to get through, but it's very, very rich. There's, there's a lot of good thinking going on in Rawls' work. Okay, so what we're looking at here, justice is fairness, a restatement. This is a more recent uh, re-articulation of some of the main points out of Rawls' as a theory of justice. Um, it came out you know, a few decades after the original book, so he had more time to think about exactly what he wanted to say. Uh, take into account different criticisms that other people had made, revise certain parts of the theory at least a little bit. So we're taking a look at, in, in some sense, his later clarification of his own view, and even at that, just, just a little part of it, the part that's really looking at um, distributive justice and some of the really main points of his theory. 
So his own theory or justice as fairness, just talking about that for a second. When we're thinking about what justice really means, there are typically questions of fairness wrapped up with questions of justice. Now, one way to think of really what Rawls is trying to do here is really present an argument that uh, justice is really a kind of fairness. And so when we're thinking about the distribution of, of wealth or, or goods through society, when we're trying to figure out what the just distribution would be, we have to think about what the fair distribution would be. And we can, just to put it in Nozickian terms, think about fairness as a question of patterning. So look, you know, if, if uh, say some of you come to my birthday party or something and I've got a birthday cake, uh, say there's six of us and I cut it into six pieces, Presumably, we all get one piece. Right? Now, if you come and it's, it's my birthday and there's six of us and I cut my birthday cake into six pieces, but I want two, there's a, and, and let's say everybody else still wants one. There's a really interesting question here about what's going on. Is it fair for me to have two and one other person not to have one? Should uh, other people have to split a piece? Would it only be right of me, even though it's my birthday and it's my birthday cake, to have a little bit less than I would want to make sure everybody gets an equal share. Now there's an instance where we can, we have this thing, the cake, we can split it up into equal shares. Um, maybe that's not always possible. Sometimes we have goods and it's just not possible to split them into equal shares. So what do we do there? Good questions. But the, the motivating concern here in, in the background of the example is really these questions of fairness. And we're thinking about justice, thinking about uh, the right way to order a society and, and the correct way that our public institutions should uh, set up systems of engagement with each other. One way to think about that is in terms of fairness. What is fair exactly? And how, what does that look like? We're going to see Rawls gives an answer to that effect. Now, Nozick, by contrast, exactly by saying the, the just distribution of goods doesn't depend on whether or not a certain pattern is being followed, is in a sense rejecting fairness as part of justice. He's saying really justice is a question of do people have what they're entitled to? And of course what you're entitled to is a, a historical matter about who's done what, who's created what, who produced what, who's owned what, and what they've decided to do with it. And those are questions about fairness. Questions about fairness seem to be pattern questions, questions of a, an overall structure or a certain sort of appearance. And those seem to be divorced from the actual entitlements individuals have based on their actions. Okay, so that out of the way, Rawls has these three points that he uses to clarify the theory up front. So first, justice is fairness. This is Rawls' theory. So Nozick's theory is, is the entitlement theory, um, you know, the theory of justice and holdings. We can give it a few different names. Rawls' own theory is justice is fairness. This is really what he calls it. So justice as fairness is framed for a democratic society where citizens are regarded as free and equal. What does that mean? This is not a political theory that is trying to account for or apply to a society where it, it is not assumed that the citizens are actually free and equal. So this doesn't apply to a dictatorship or a tyranny or some kind of society where um, people have different sorts of rights and privileges based on things like their birthright you know, a, a, an aristocratic way of organizing society or something like that. It's a society where all of the citizens are regarded as, as basically free. So by default, free, not subjects to someone else's power, right? They're free and they're also equal. Now, not equal in terms of material wealth, but equal really in moral terms, that no individual citizen should have more rights than any other, just based on some feature outside of the individual's control. Second, justice as fairness takes the primary subject of political justice to be the basic structure of society. What does Rawls mean by that? Well, really what he means is by, by the basic structure of society is really the basic organization of a society's main institutions. So questions about the um, you know, rule of law, uh, questions about education, healthcare broadly speaking, political arrangements. So it's not really what he's talking about here. The primary subject isn't the details. It's not, oh, should we set the, the income tax rate here or here? It's not a question of, uh, you know, exactly which drug should be covered by, say, a national pharmacare plan. It's not a question of exactly which operation should be covered by um, 
publicly funded healthcare, right? So it's not in questions of the details like that. Uh, or even say, when we're thinking about the political system, it's not a question of exactly which form of, of representative democracy to use, right? Should we have first past the post voting or proportional representation? It's not really about that. It's about the very basic structure that is, what sorts of large structures are there going to be about which we have details to discuss? So just when I was mentioning, say, with, with healthcare, we can get into all these particular questions about what sorts of procedures and medications to cover, but there's the larger question in the basic structure of society, should there be publicly funded healthcare or not? Um, if our answer is yes, there should be, there's a question of why? What sorts of reasons or principles support that? What kind of goal, if any, are we trying to reach with it? Or what sorts of rights are we trying to respond to with it? So it's not so much a question of those particular details, rather, rather these are, are broader questions about how societies ought to be organized overall. The third point, justice as fairness is a form of political liberalism. Like I talked about in the previous video when we were talking about Nozick, liberalism is, is very sort of a broad tent uh, approach to political philosophy. What does it hold really, you know, in some sense minimally or, or at its core? Really that freedom is a good thing. When we think about the, what he said about a democratic society up in the first point, if we regard citizens as free and equal, we, we can regard them as rights bearers. They, there are certain things we can't do to individuals in that kind of society. Um, why? Really for certain moral reasons, that we believe there are good moral reasons to regard citizens as free and equal in this sort of way. And ultimately we're trying to produce a political theory that is really trying to tease out the question of what kinds of freedoms should all people be allowed to have if we're going to have to have certain restrictions on freedoms at all. What kinds of restrictions can be justified. And this really leads us into some of his other points here. Um, so talking about the political relationship as distinct from say the family relationship or just uh, the associations we have with friends or, or hobby groups, clubs, um, even say ad academic associations or something like that. The political relationship is different from other sorts of relationships because one, it's always coercive. Political power is coercive and it uses the apparatus of enforcement. What does that mean? Well, political power, it's not a suggestion. Rather, it's the exercise of you know, real coercive power through, by the state, through the apparatus of enforcement, namely police uh, and the, the whole um, criminal and enforcement system, the justice system, right? Well, we might call it sort of the justice system very broadly, uh, but the in some sense, the criminal system, the judiciary, police officers, even municipal law and so on. Political power isn't a suggestion. You can't just, you know, if the government says, oh, uh, it's illegal to park here, you can't just say, oh, I don't feel that way, right? It's not up for debate. Um, and really, when it comes right down to it, if there are certain things that the, the state says you can't do, um, exercises that through the apparatus of enforcement, but you just go on and do it anyways, Ultimately, they can, they can stick you in a concrete box you know, and, and restrict your movement. We call that jail. They can take away your property. Uh, you can become physically injured as a result of these things. So political power is coercive, right? And the political structure is involuntary. As he puts it, we enter it only by birth and exit only by death. So we're always stuck within the political structure. We're always subject to political power. Political power is coercive. Right? It's not against our will. And there's an immediate tension that starts to come up here. We think back just to the previous slide, if we regard citizens as free and equal, but we note we're always subject to political power and political power is always coercive. There's an immediate tension here. If we're all supposed to be equal and free to do what we want, to make choices, to lead our own lives, then what is it that can justify that coercive power of state control? And again, Rawls, his theory here, just basically by definition, I'll put it that way, he's not producing a political theory here to try to account for other forms of political organization, anything like a dictatorship or a tyranny, any sort of form 
of political theory where we view state control uh, as this coercive control over subjects, but the subjects themselves don't have any rights to be free uh, beyond what the state decides to grant them. That's really not the sort of background Rawls is worried about. That's just not the kind of society he's interested in. He's interested in this form of political liberalism about viewing the citizens within a society as free and equal. So if the citizens are free and equal, how is it that the state can use course of power to force them to do certain things and cut off certain choices from them? Well, this raises this further question. So we've got what he calls reasonable pluralism. What's that? Well, it's reasonable but comp competing accounts of the good life. Different views about what it is that really makes up the best sort of life for a human, uh, but that are all reasonable in the sense that they aren't just sort of clearly irrational. We can give some sort of set of reasons in support of it, but the accounts are, are competing in the sense that they're mutually exclusive. So look, just as a few examples off the top of my head, um, we've been looking at, say, philosophy of religion in this course. Uh, and of course, we're looking at arguments in favor of the view that God exists, so at least one argument against uh, the view that God exists. And so there's this question, to be a, a good person, to lead a good life, do you have to have uh, religious beliefs in general or not? Right? Are, are atheists by definition bad people? Further question, even if we think you need to have religious beliefs to lead a good life, right? and perhaps leading a good life versus being a good person, we could separate those questions as well. I'll just sort of leave them in a pile for now. Uh, is it particular religious beliefs you have to have? Do you have to be a Catholic or a Lutheran or a you know, whatever? Uh, or is it some sort of cluster of, of beliefs, right? Some um, umbrella um, set of religious beliefs that they might call, you know, Christian beliefs or Islamic beliefs or Jewish beliefs or something like that. Now, people who actually hold religious beliefs tend to think that they're important in some sense, right? that they contribute to their life going well. Now, presumably, uh, what we have going on here is one case, one sort of microcosm of reasonable pluralism, right? You've got people with different religious beliefs. Uh, they're reasonable in the sense of they're not just clearly irrational. They also, part of what it is to be reasonable in Rawls' account is really to be tolerant of other uh, views that one can't just sort of openly refute, but aren't compatible with one's own views. So he says, just as a, as a fact, in modern democratic societies, we have reasonable pluralism. We have disagreement over the good life, over how we should lead our lives, about what sorts of things are valuable, what sorts of things aren't valuable, what we should believe, what we should do, how we should act. We've got broad disagreement about that amongst these free and equal citizens. And in a democracy, political power is regarded as the power of free and equal citizens as a collective body. So political power is this thing that as a group, democratic citizens within a society hold, right? They're, they're really the ones that, that wield it. It's only through the consent of uh, free and equal citizens that political power can be justly exercised or legitimately exercise, exercised. So this raises the question of political legitimacy as he puts it. So political power is, really the power of these free and equal citizens as a collective body, right? It's their consent that makes political power legitimate, but they disagree, right? We've got reasonable pluralism. We've got this broad disagreement over what the good life looks like. So this question, the question of political legitimacy, Rawls puts it this way, in light of what reasons and values, of what kind of a conception of justice, can citizens legitimately exercise the course of power over one another? This is ultimately the sort of question Rawls wants to answer here. This is sort of his, his basic problem. How can we justify the course of use of political power if that political power itself is really uh, only legitimate based on the consent of free and equal citizens, but those free and equal citizens disagree with each other over what the good life looks like, uh, and thus when course of power would be justified intervening? So look, one, one way of uh, putting this, what sorts of restrictions should be put on people right, in light of reasonable pluralism? 
what kind of coercion should we use the police and the apparatus of law enforcement and the law to actually enforce? Just going back to the example I had, we can have these different conceptions of, say, on, on religion. Should religious belief be a matter of state control? Should law and law enforcement be involved in people's religious beliefs? Should it be illegal to be an atheist or an agnostic? Should, be, should it be illegal to hold uh, a particular sort of religious belief, whatever that might be? This is the sort of question Rawls is interested in, in a very overall and broad way. And as we're going to see, what we're really going to wind up focusing on by the end is really how this all applies to the distribution of goods in society as a way of answering those issues. So this is what gets us what he calls the liberal principle of legitimacy. This is how we answer that, that question that we just raised. And he puts it this way, he says, political power is legitimate only when it is exercised in accordance with the constitution, whether it's written or unwritten, the essentials of which all citizens, as reasonable and rational, can endorse in light of their common human reason. So what is Rawls trying to aim for here? Well, that coercive political power winds up being legitimate when it really accords uh, with, or it, it's uh, compatible with, it's justified by certain key essential elements that all citizens as reasonable and rational could endorse. Um, we're gonna see how he thinks we can get this, but we've got broad disagreement on lots of, of particular questions about how we should lead our lives, but Rawls thinks we can actually have quite broad agreement on certain key questions uh, which will form this constitutional level of agreement. We can have this basic level of agreement in society about the basic structure of society within which we can then frame and hold our debates over all sorts of other things. So there are gonna be certain essentials, right? Certain basic rights that we think all people should have and then we'll have those, those debates over the details um, within that domain really outlined by those basic rights. So there are certain things that the apparatus of coercive government control just aren't, it, uh, there's a certain domain where government power just isn't going to be allowed in. Uh, and so we're gonna actually, as we're gonna see out of Rawls, try to in some sense get by with a, a a minimal amount of state interference. Though, of course, Rawls is going to argue that more state interference is justified than Nozick would want to allow for. So how do we get these essentials? How do we get these key points of agreement? This is where Rawls introduces this original position thought experiment. And he thinks from that, from this original position, we get two basic principles that really uh, speak to what is it, what are these essentials that all citizens as reasonable and rational are going to agree to on a constitutional or basic level. Now, this original position, what is it? Well, it's a kind of thought experiment that Rawls introduces. And what it's supposed to do is get us thinking morally about the basic structure of society. So when I say it's a thought experiment, it's it's not something Rawls is claiming has actually happened or even could happen. Rather, it's just a way of getting us thinking in a certain way and isolating certain parts of our thinking uh, to then see what follows from it. What he's trying to isolate are our most basic moral convictions, really. So Rawls's view is absolutely a normative view. This isn't just some descriptive um, you know, account of what's going on in politics. Rather, this is an account of how we should be doing these things based on what Rawls thinks are our firmest and most widely shared moral convictions. Uh, in fact, he puts it this way, and this I know this is sort of a, a big quote, but I, I think it really captures Rawls's motivations and his method here. When talking about the original position, he says, the idea here is to use our firmest considered convictions about the nature of a democratic society as a fair system of cooperation between free and equal citizens, as modeled in the original position, to see whether the combined assertion of those convictions so expressed will help us to identify an appropriate distributive principle for the basic structure with its economic and social inequalities and citizens' life prospects. 
Now there's a lot going on in there, but just a few things to highlight. Uh, one, the original position is really going to be modeling our firmest considered convictions about the nature of a democratic society. Right? And what is it to have a, a democratic society? Well, it's a system of cooperation, right? not competition, it's a system of cooperation between free and equal citizens. A democracy is basically a cooperative enterprise where people, although they disagree, perhaps in, in very strong ways, come together and set aside those disagreements to cooperate as best they can. The original position tries to uh, model these convictions, these moral convictions, and ultimately spit out or produce for us uh, this appropriate distributive principle that really determines the basic structure of society, which then affects the economic and social inequalities in citizens' overall life prospects. So something that's important to think here, think about here, Rawls says, is that what we're talking about aren't just short-term consequences. When we're talking about the basic structure of society, we are talking about the, the background conditions within which the citizens of that society are gonna live their entire lives. Now, of course, people can move between societies, but just you know, on, on the assumption that, in fact, most people born into a certain society actually live most of their, their life there, then the, the way that society is structured is going to determine the whole course of those people's lives. Now, of course, all sorts of other things are gonna do that too, their family, their friends, their decisions, um, what they actually do and so on. But the sorts of options available to them and the sorts of supports that are available and the sorts of consequences they'll face as a result of their actions are all a result of that basic structure of the society. Because that basic structure really affects everything. It affects what sorts of equality or inequality there are, what sorts of opportunities there are for people, what sorts of economic arrangements there are, the possibilities for changing one's own situation through the decisions they make. So this basic structure has a, a huge impact on the possible life prospects of all citizens within the society. So what's going on in this original position? Well, it's, uh, there, there's really sort of two parts to it to keep in mind. But this original position uh, puts people under what he calls a veil of ignorance. Uh, and this is, it's a thought experiment. It, it's unclear how we could ever even make this work, though maybe with certain uh, futuristic technologies and sort of sci-fi thinking, uh, this would at least be possible, maybe. I, I'm still not sure. So in the original position, what we do is we take people, right? We take people in the society, really representative persons, but uh, you could try to take everybody if you wanted. You put them under this veil of ignorance. What does that do? It really tries to remove the biases people have, their self-interested biases, by hiding from themselves their own characteristics. So under the veil of ignorance, people cease to understand where they fit into society. So just taking me for an example, um, if we put me under the veil of ignorance and say we were trying to figure out the basic constitutional essentials of Canada. So Canada is going to be a democratic society. Uh, citizens are regarded as free and equal. The political organization of society is really a method of cooperation between these citizens. And we need to figure out when political power is going to be legitimate, what we can use the apparatus of state control to coerce people to do and not to do. Now, of course, when we think about this on, you know, normally, right? when we're thinking in terms of politics and how we might vote and what the best way uh, we think it would be for Canada to be organized, it's very easy to think in a self-interested, biased manner, right? to think about who we are and ultimately what would favor us the most, and then argue, really just based on self-interest, that that's the best arrangement for Canadian society in general. So look, uh, just looking through some of the things that the veil of ignorance hides, hides their gender, religion, culture, socioeconomic class, ability, right? All sorts of things. So look, um, we can articulate several characteristics of me, right? I'm a uh, you know, Caucasian, white, male, um, heterosexual, presumably middle class, and 
I'm not sure what the numbers are these days, but I, I say I'm, you know, middle class, um, come from, you know, culture, Canadian, whatever exactly that is. Um, you know, that's sort of, um, I've, I've got sort of a mixture of French, English heritage. Um, my abilities, well, you know, I've got a PhD, I'm instructed at a university. Uh, presumably I've done a few things right over the years, but probably done a lot of things wrong as well, but hey, at least I, I made a few good decisions along the way. Um, fairly intelligent, not, uh, you know, not very good at sports or anything like that. So what might I, if I'm thinking in self-interested terms, want out of the political structure of Canada, right? What, how might I think our society would be best organized? Well, if I'm doing it purely self-interested terms, um, of course, we all want good things. So look, one way of organizing Canadian society is to, whatever the details are, is to organize it in such a way that the, uh, you know, white, male, able-bodied, middle-class, um, heterosexual philosophers get all the best stuff, right? We, we run the country, we get to be in charge, we get all the, you know, the, the best of the money and everything. Um, and why do I want that? Well, really just because it favors me. When it comes right down to it, what might I really want? Well, just to like be the dictator and, and have everything. Now Rawls thinks even that's sort of wrong. He thinks we're not all, you know, jerks like that. We're, we're not all so radically self-interested that we can't even consider other people's well-being or, or that we don't even care about it. So in some sense, he thinks that that further position I take, oh, I just want to be in charge, he says, most of us aren't really like that. Right? Now, if we go back a step, even the, the sort of self-interested structure of saying, oh, you know, people like me should have all the best things. There's a scope question there about how narrow I want to make it. I was saying, oh, you know, the philosopher should have all the best stuff and have the most money. Well, maybe that's too narrow, right? Maybe I think uh, it should actually be the academics, right? Academics should run the country and have most of the money. Or maybe, you know, if I'm a business person, I think, oh, the business people should have it. Or say I'm a farmer and I say, oh, the, the farmer should really be in charge, right? Or whatever. And you can think about uh, different structures of society in these general terms about what, what gender, or religion, or culture, or socioeconomic class, or set of abilities should our political structure most favor. Now, as long as we know where we fit in, there's always this threat of bias. Now, we can try to fight against it by trying to step outside of ourselves and look at things from a, a more sort of abstract or general position. And this is exactly what the original position is trying to get us to do by trying to hide our, our position in society from ourselves to in effect cut off our self-interested thinking. So what Rawls is trying to get you to do in the original position is to think about society just in moral terms and not in terms of self-interest because of course those can pull us apart. We might think the right thing is this, but the thing that's good for me is that, and now we're torn in two directions. And you can think about this in terms of, of Kant and Mill. Right? What happens when it seems like the right thing isn't necessarily the best thing in some other terms because it's not for your self-interest. So we don't know where we fit into society in the original position, right? We don't know uh, how we're going to be advantaged or disadvantaged by the basic structure of society. But in this original position, people do know the general facts about the world, uh, including all sorts of facts about how different social structures would um, change life prospects for people that had to live within them. So in, in some sense, assuming the original position, we know all the general facts about human nature that would help us uh, make a good decision, make an informed decision. We know all sorts of facts about psychology and sociology and, and anthropology. We know what people are like. We know the facts about their biology. Um, we know that there are various competing religions and what sorts of things they hold. We know about different sorts of economic arrangements and uh, what sorts of people they would favor. We know what sort of interests people have, what generally makes somebody's life go well or go poorly. Uh, and despite the fact that we have reasonable pluralism, one of the things that Rawls thinks that we can ultimately agree on is that people like to have some kind of choice about what sort of life they're going to lead. So we might disagree on what it is we think makes our lives go best, but we can broadly agree that it's best for all of us if we get a pretty uh, 
a large amount of choice in how we want to lead our own lives so that we're not being forced to lead a life that somebody else thinks is good. So what are we going to get out of this original position? Rawls thinks it's going to be two principles of justice. Right? Now, one thing that I, in some sense, can't forgive from Rawls, he, he was brilliant. All, you know, whether or not we agree with him, really intelligent person, uh, really, really influential, uh, and just a, a terrible advertiser. Um, he didn't name them. He, he always talked about them for years, for decades, about these two principles of justice. And he didn't give them names. I don't think he would have been a very good salesperson. So we're going to call them the liberty principle and the equality principle. Now, the equality principle is really made up of two sub-principles, as we're going to see, but we're going to name them this. Why? This, I think these names really capture what's going on in there. Now, maybe Rawls didn't want to name them this way just because he didn't want to be misleading or, or make people have a certain expectation, but I think these names fairly um, uh, capture what's going on in there. Though I might want to rename the equality principle into the equity principle. We'll, we'll set that aside for the moment. So what are these two principles? Well, the first one, the liberty principle. Oh, my apologies. Oh. So the first one, each person has the same indefeasible claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties, which scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all. It's a bit of a mouthful. What does that amount to? Uh, really broad freedoms, right? Uh, an indefeasible claim that is one that we can't overcome or set aside due to other good reasons. Uh, we've got this claim to this fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties. So in this basic structure of society, there's going to be this scheme of basic liberties that everybody's entitled to and that we can't um, set aside somehow. Second, oh, I'm sorry. Second, the equality principle. Uh, and this has the two subparts to it. Social and economic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions. First, they are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. And second, they are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society, which Rawls calls the difference principle. So he calls the second part of the second principle the difference principle, but then he doesn't have a name for the first principle or the first half of the second principle. I find that a little bit odd, which is why, for our sake, I'm calling them the liberty principle and the equality principle. All right, and you can see maybe the second principle should actually be called the inequality principle because it's governing what sorts of inequalities we should allow in a society. So a few more words on both of these principles. The first principle, the liberty principle, is prior to and more important than the second principle, the equality principle. And the liberty principle is there to guarantee a whole range of basic liberties, basic freedoms, uh, precisely of the sort you'd find in what well, you do find in democratic countries like Canada and the United States. You go pick up the United States Bill of Rights or the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you are going to read there basically the set of rights that Rawls is talking about. And it's the same, roughly same basic set of rights that people like John Stuart Mill were talking about in the 19th century. So, you know, freedom of thought, freedom, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of associating with people, of, of speaking your mind, uh, political liberties, being able to vote, being able to participate in politics, right, run for office and so on, uh, integrity, integrity of the person, right, not being subject to uh, unreasonable search and seizure, being able to lead a, a, a free life overall. Um, all these basic rights, all these things that I think many of us nowadays think are just in some sense, the baseline of how a society ought to regard its citizens. Now, these liberties are really on the constitutional level. They're part of the basic structure of society. So these are things that uh, a legislature, say Parliament Canada, can't just come together and vote out of existence, right? Let's say, I don't know, somehow or other, um, whatever party, right, maybe we even just invent some party, gets elected, gets a majority in Canadian Parliament, if these rights are part of the constitutional level of society, they can't, uh, that party can't just by majority vote, which would be normally what's required to make something law, can't just come in and say, oh yeah, there's no more freedom of thought and conscience and uh, there's no more freedom of speech and you're not allowed to participate in politics and so on, right? So there are certain restrictions on what sorts of limitations that society can produce 
how it can use its coercive power against its citizens. So Rawls thinks in the original position, if we all got together, we didn't know where into society we would fit, but we also know general facts about societies, you know, that there's disagreement and, and all this sort of thing. Rawls thinks we would all agree to a pretty broad set of constitutional liberties, precisely so that we're all as free as possible to lead our own lives as we see fit. Uh, he thinks this is justified on, on moral grounds, uh, because coercion in general is bad, if we can avoid it. This would also be justified, uh, to some extent, just based on self-interest in the original position, but it's a kind of self-interest that we all have. Because we've removed our biases in the original position about where we fit into in society, what we're left with are just the generally shared biases that humans have, uh, or, or perhaps I should say interests, the, the basic kind of self-interest humans have, namely things like staying alive and leading a good life. Now, when we think about it in those very broad terms that we all have these same basic sorts of desires, once we remove some of the grounds for, for bias and interference and disagreement, namely our particular situations and the things that separate us, Rawls thinks we can actually find really broad agreement on something like this, that should, we should all be as free as possible to do what we want, uh, because in some sense we all want that, right? None of us want other people telling us what to do, even if a lot of us would like to tell other people what to do. Second, uh, the, oh, uh, one last thing I should say here, um, and I've already mentioned this, the liberty principle and what it justifies, those, those rights and freedoms, these can't be traded away for other benefits. So the liberty principle comes first, not only in just the order in which the principles are presented, but it's the most important principle. So uh, Rawls thinks we can't trade away liberties, we can't trade away freedoms, even for the sake of other goods, like increased equality, right? If we thought increased equality was a good thing and we could get that by sacrificing certain freedoms, Rawls doesn't think that would be right. One interesting thing to note here is that Nozick could take precisely the scheme and say, right, we have a, a basic liberty to do what we want with our property to interfere with somebody's ability to choose what they want to do with what they own and what they're entitled to is really to violate one of their rights. Rawls can counter this and say, the right about what you want to do with your property isn't one of these basic rights covered by the liberty principle. That's something separate and that's something that the equality principle is really going to govern. So just speaking of that and looking at the equality principle here, uh, we've got the two sub-principles. I'll call the first one the opportunity principle, just because it neatly captures what's going on there. So that first part, positions of social and economic inequality should be open to all under condition of fair equality of opportunity. So what are we talking about? Positions of social and economic inequality. One way to organize society is to make everybody perfectly equal both in social terms and economic terms. So in social terms, that would mean there's absolutely no distinction in terms of, of rank, uh, in terms of what we might think of as uh, socially prestigious positions or not. All right, so, and if you think about uh, communism, in some sense, communism is precisely the, the political philosophy that says there shouldn't be any inequalities at all, either socially, right? There should be no kings or queens or aristocrats or, uh, you know, people in charge or anything like that. Everybody should be equal on a social level. Nobody's above anybody else. Same with economics. Nobody should have any more than anybody else. It should be just flat, sort of equal distribution across the board. Um, and, and even that's a little bit misleading. It's really everybody should get what, whatever they need, right? People should get what they need. Uh, and so that there might be some differences in terms of what people need, but everybody's equal in the sense of everybody's getting just what they need. Now, that's one way to organize society, right? And in the original position, this would be something we could think about. How do we want to organize society? How much inequality do we want to allow? And Rawls thinks this is the right way to ask the question. Inequality uh, and, and having property, these aren't just rights that, that we somehow have from the heavens or, or wherever. For Rawls, really, Questions about rights are embedded in these larger questions about what we want our society and our political system to look like. Uh, and so when we're thinking about things like property rights, these are really questions about what's the society 
going to support? What's the society going to allow? Right? Nozick takes a different view and, and thinks we all just have these rights to, to property, to holdings, um, really independent of political organization. So I'll, I'll set that aside for now, but it's an interesting point to know. So we could have perfect equality in terms of the society and, and the economics. Rawls thinks there's actually good reason not to favor that because we can actually have a better society when there's some level of inequality to it, right? Uh, it's actually better to have some positions of social and economic inequality precisely because economic inequality can provide a good incentive to people, right? Paying people more money to do one job rather than another might attract more people to that job. Uh, and that having more people doing something in particular can be good for a society, right? Uh, that if we didn't allow people differences and say what, how much they're gonna get paid or something like that, it would actually discourage people from doing certain things that would be good for society. Having positions of social inequality can also be good. Some people are motivated by uh, getting a, a certain kind of prestige based on their position, being, uh, and, and you might roll your eyes at some of the examples, but you know, look, being a politician or, or say a lawyer or a medical doctor or something like that comes with a certain amount of social prestige. Um, people can be motivated by these things. And Rawls thinks, so it's fine to allow for at least some degree of inequality uh, if it makes society better, but first we have to make sure all of that inequality, um, those positions that that inequality allows for, right? Those, those positions that are somehow better than other positions need to be open to all, that is all citizens, under condition of fair equality of opportunity. What does that mean? Well, it's not just formal equality of opportunity. It's not just that, you know, there's no law against certain parts of the population being able to hold some of those positions. Rather, we have to have actual structures in place to make sure everybody really has a fair shot at those positions. We're gonna see what that's going to mean uh, in a moment. The second part, the difference principle, is that these social and economic inequalities are to be to the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society. What does that mean? Well, again, if we take perfect equality as our baseline, right, we say, okay, we could have a society where everybody is perfectly equal in terms of their social position and their, their economic position. Uh, and that would be, in some sense, the default way to think about how to organize, organize a society of free and equal citizens, right? Uh, if they're all equal, then they should have the same social prestige and the same goods, right? The same wealth. But there could be good reasons for allowing some differences there. That's a question of how big do we want the differences to be? Well, the second part, the difference principle is really saying the differences can be really of, of any magnitude so long as they're best for the worst off or least advantaged members of society. So how much inequality to allow, right? We could reframe this in terms of how much property or how much wealth should the 1%, top 1% of society own? Rawls would say the way to answer that question is to ask how much, um, how much property or how much wealth can the 1% hold that ultimately makes the worst off people in society best off? So look, if the wealthiest 1% of people in a society, if they own 50% of the wealth in the society, and somehow that would make the worst off people in society better off, Rawls would say, well, then do that. If the top 1% only owning 5% of the wealth in society would make the worst off people better off, Rawls would say, well, then that's what you should do. So between them, these two principles are supposed to govern any sort of inequalities we allow into the society. Because allowing inequality itself is something we have to justify based on our background assumptions that we're producing a political theory here that's concerned with a democratic society where citizens are free and equal. So how do we justify the inequality? Well, by making sure that the inequality is open to anybody, right? Anybody, uh, not just in principle, but in practice, has a real shot, right? Uh, um, a real equality of opportunity of actually trying to pursue those positions. And second, the existence of the positions themselves are actually good things for the worst off people in society, the least advantaged members of society, right? So what's this gonna mean in practice? Well, look, Rawls is agnostic about economics. He doesn't have any favorite economic theory. Uh, if you look in, in the theory of justice, he has some extensive discussions about economics and different ways to think about it and, and all these sorts of things. But if we're thinking specifically about uh, 
the distribution of goods and society, the distribution of wealth, which is really our, our sort of main topic question here. Although we see Rawls is, is giving us a much richer theory overall. If an absolutely free market with no redistributive scheme, right? That is having no taxation at all. All you have is a completely free market economy. Uh, the government's not involved in any way, shape or form. They don't prop up any industries. They don't tax, they don't redistribute wealth. They don't have uh, any programs to that effect, other than you know the absolute bare minimum, say having a police force or something to make sure our, our basic rights aren't violated. If that kind of system is best for the least advantaged members of society, that would be the economic system Rawls would endorse. But of course, it seems highly unlikely that a, uh, a completely free market with no redistributive scheme at all would actually be best off for the least advantaged members of society. Right? So what, what does that mean? Oh, sorry. Um, well, think about it this way. So Rawls says we can try to represent different segments of society through representative persons. So rather than trying to think of every particular person in society and try to think of you know, the, the one individual who is least advantaged, we should instead think in broader terms about what sorts of characteristics make people more or less advantaged within a society. So look, going back to some of the characteristics I was outlining about myself, right? Um, look, I'm, you know, able-bodied, right? That's, that's a kind of advantage for me. Uh, when people have physical disabilities of some sort, that can restrict their access to certain places. It can make it more difficult to get around. They have to spend more money, potentially on mobility aids, like a, a wheelchair or a cane or something like that. There are certain areas they might not be able to get into, right? Just think around uh, Lethbridge. There are buildings and businesses where you have to go up a set of stairs to get into them. What if you can't do a set of stairs? You're effectively cut off from that area. There's now a certain kind of opportunity you can't take advantage of. Uh, we can think about, say, my gender, right? I'm male, that confers me certain advantages, unfortunately. Uh, I'm also fairly intelligent. Maybe you don't think so, and that's fine, right? I, I hope whatever judgment you come to me and, and my ability is based on your experience with me and not just some sort of uh, hand waving at, well, you know, he's, he's the teacher of the class, so I guess he knows his stuff, right? There should be some, you know, hopefully, uh, sort of default view that the people who are, are instructing a course know something about it. But I think there's a lot to be said for earning that sort of respect through uh, demonstrating competence with material and, and uh, you know, being well organized and things like that. So look, I like to think I'm at least a reasonably intelligent person. That comes with certain advantages as well. What if I wasn't? What if I uh, had so a physical disability? Right? What if I also had a mental disability, say a really serious mental disability and a really serious physical disability? Let's also say I was a woman instead of a man, right? Uh, just because being a woman comes with fewer advantages than does being a man. Let's say I was also a member of a racial minority and a member of a religious minority, right? In each of these cases, I'm thinking just in broad terms, but now I'm starting to construct a representative person of who the least advantaged member of society, least advantaged member of society would be, right? Somebody that would fit into this kind of category. So really what Rawls is getting at is, what would be best for somebody like that? So let's just think of the, the mental and physical disability, just, just as a way to start with. Look, an absolutely free market with no redistributive scheme. So people think basically what Nozick wants. Um, you're not entitled to anything unless somebody freely gives it to you. So what does that mean? Well, let's say I have a really serious mental and physical disability. Um, so, yeah, and my disabilities are so severe, I can't learn to do any sort of skilled labor. Uh, and in fact, just my physical abilities prevent me from being able to, uh, I'll, I'll put it in these terms, you know, work a normal job. I cannot work 40 hours a week. I don't have the kind of mobility required of me to do um, low skilled labor of the sort that let's just assume I, I would be able to uh, learn and, and carry out with my mental capabilities. 
Um, even that, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about saying that because this makes it sound like somebody with a mental disability can never learn to do skilled labor, which, which is untrue, right? What I am thinking of here and what I'm trying to talk about is a case where somebody has a, like a really, really serious mental disability paired with a really, really serious physical disability. And that these two things paired together seriously limit this person's ability to engage in um, the sort of labor most people are willing to pay for. Right? Particularly if we think that uh, this, this person, this representative person, uh, is going to need things like mobility aids just be, to be able to get around. So they're going to need some sort of resources up front to invest in themselves to even be able to then access other opportunities to get more resources. It's just not clear that in an absolutely free market, right? And we're talking like absolutely free market. So that this includes no publicly funded healthcare, no publicly funded education. Right? Uh, in a situation like that, there are very good odds that people who are in the category of being the least advantaged members of society, those people are not going to be well served by that kind of system. Assuming that's true, what kind of economic arrangement should we have? Well, some kind of redistributive scheme. What's that going to involve? Taxes, right? That's going to involve taxing certain members of society and redistributing that wealth to other members of society, right? For what purpose? Well, for the purposes outlined in the equality principle, to ensure that the inequalities that are present in society are really to the, the greatest advantage to the least advantaged members of society. Why would we think that way? Because a democracy is a system of cooperation between citizens who are free and equal. We're in it together. We're on the same team. It's not me against you, against the least advantaged member of society. It's all of us in this together, trying to work together to live in a better world, right? Am I entitled to the fruits of my labor? Well, yeah, certainly to some degree. Does that mean I should keep every little bit of my paycheck? I think last time I, I complained a bit, you know, put on my Nozick hat. Look at how much money I lose off every one of my paychecks. I'd have to go do the math, but um, I think I could probably safely say I, I lose something like, uh, a third of my, my pay in, in various sorts of taxes. And I'd have to go look. I know some of that's, you know, pension contributions and things like this. Uh, but, you know, I, I pay some pretty serious taxes. If I weren't being taxed, I would have considerably more disposable income. So one way to look at it is that my money's being taken from me against my will through the coercive apparatus of, of state power. Sure, that's one way to look at it. Rawls says that there's a different way to look at it too. We can put ourselves in the original position. We can think about what general principles of justice we think apply to a democratic society like the one we live in. We can then endorse those principles for ourselves. We can come to see that apparatus of state enforcement and that coercive system of wealth redistribution is actually something that we consent to. We might grumble and say, oh, you know, look at how much my paycheck I'm losing. But we can also step outside of ourselves and our narrow self-interest and say, overall, this is the kind of society that's the best kind of society. We are taking from the better off to help out the worst off. And ultimately, a society is, uh, and the, the justice of a society is determined by how well it treats its least advantaged members. Justice, being a kind of fairness, is really making sure that everybody, no matter the situation they're born into, no matter the background conditions uh, around them, no matter what uh, features their life has as a result of the uh, outside of the result of their own choices, right? So their conditions of their birth and upbringing, their uh, religion or culture or gender or physical ability or mental ability, that people are not advantaged or disadvantaged based on uh, factors that they themselves can't control. That Justice being a kind of fairness is really making sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to pursue uh, positions of inequality to better their own lives and to lead their lives in really the way they see fit. Not providing people with at least a basic level of, of resources, the basic level that they require to be able to pursue those opportunities itself is a kind of injustice and one that Rawls thinks we shouldn't tolerate as a democratic society. Okay, 
I think I've already gone a little bit over time, so I'll go ahead and stop it there. Uh, I hope this has helped illuminate Rawls' position, and I hope you can see some of the contrast here with Nozick in terms of how they think about society in the first place and how they go about uh, justifying opposing conclusions on whether or not justice demands that we have a coercive system of wealth redistribution within a democratic society like ours. I hope you're all doing well, and I'll see you again next time when we take a look at John Stuart Mill. Bye for now.